Welcome to this episode of Flourishing Leadership. I'm your host, Guy Rogers, and our mission here is to help you unleash the full potential of your leadership calling. You can find out more about Flourishing Leadership at flourishing-leadership.com. My guest today is Cal Thomas. Cal is a journalist, pundit, author, TV and radio commentator, and one of the most widely syndicated columnists in America. His 50-year journalism career includes anchoring, reporting commentary for Newsmax, KPRC TV in Houston, NBC News in Washington, and other outlets. For 10 years, he co-wrote the Common Ground column for USA Today with his colleague, Bob Beckel. Thomas began his journalism career at the age of 16, and 2023 marks over 50 years as a journalist. He is the best-selling author of America's Expiration Date, What Works, The Things That Matter Most, Common Ground, Uncommon Sense, Blinded by Might, The Death of Ethics in America, Book Burning, Liberals for Lunch, The Freedom Dream, and Public Persons and Private Lives. And his latest book, a memoir titled A Watchman in the Night. Thomas is a wide-ranging social commentator, not a, quote, beltway insider, who supports traditional conservative values and the American can-do spirit. A native of Washington, D.C. and graduate of American University, Thomas is married to Christy Jean, also known as CJ. So, Cal, I have followed your columns for many years, and I have to say it truly is an honor and privilege to have you as my guest today. Thank you so very much for being with me and our listeners. Well, I'm delighted, Guy. Thank you. Gee whiz, I thought you were reading my obit there for a minute. (laughs) Not yet. Not yet. You still have too much to do. (laughs) Thanks. All right. So as I was reading your book, I just it occurred to me there's just so much to unpack. I almost wasn't even sure where to start. So I keyed in on the introduction because I've always been intrigued by your ability to develop friendships with people who are polar opposites of you in matters of political philosophy and faith. Uh, This was evident in Tom Johnson's introduction of the former president and publisher of the Los Angeles Times, former CEO of CNN. And he wrote, quote, while our political views are very different, we became friends. His column added a much needed conservative voice to newspapers, talk shows and bookshelves. In our so often viciously polarized world today, Please share your insights on how you developed and maintained those kinds of relationships. Well, my example was uh, Jesus of Nazareth, of course, who hung out a lot with the uh, what I call uh, Republicans and sinners of his day. That would be the early <laughs> Democrats. A uh, little humor there. Uh, uh-huh. I don't hate anybody. I mean, I, I admire the uh, the skills and the accomplishments of many in my profession. It doesn't uh, matter that they might disagree with me. I think you can have friendships no matter what your political position is. But I truly like these people. And uh, Tom, of course, uh, opened the door for me as a syndicated columnist, and I owe everything to him because of that. He's an old school Lyndon Johnson type Democrat. He worked for LBJ. I first met him when he was a White House fellow in the Lyndon Johnson administration. And uh, he is a true pluralist. He believes in responsible ideas from all perspectives. And you don't see that very much today. Uh, You see people throwing rhetorical bombs at each other. And if you disagree with my position, then you're evil and destroying America. That doesn't advance anybody's cause, really. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, I had a number of people endorsing this book from all perspectives, not only from Tom, but Henry Louis Gates Jr. of Harvard, close friend of President Obama, to Pat Sajak of Wheel of Fortune. I was trying to get uh, Vanna White, but she was too busy picking out dresses. <laughs> well, your point about old school uh, liberal, things have changed a lot in 60 years. Yeah. Uh, well, you but, had liberals and then now you have the left. Correct. There's a big difference. There uh, is a big difference. Liberals back in the 60s uh, were anti-communist. Uh, they, like Jack Kennedy, were for tax cuts. Uh, to uh, energize the economy. I don't think Jack Kennedy could get the nomination today in the the party. So I think a lot has changed. The reason I wrote this book, uh, beginning with uh, the year 1984, uh, when my column started, was I wanted to take a little look back at uh, and see what has happened through those years. And uh, several things never change. First of all, of course, human nature never changes. But also uh, the, the arguments are pretty much the same. 
More spending is going to improve education. It hasn't. You know, the whole social changes since 1984. Whoever thought in certainly my childhood that we would be debating things like transgenderism, my mm-hmm. goodness, and drag queens. I mean, when I was uh, in high school, a uh, drag was something you did on a uh, on a road with uh, a car spinning your wheels, right? Right. Uh, so all kinds of things now that uh, God calls an abomination are now uh, uh, in the uh, marketplace, and we're told that we have to accept everything. So we've come a long way, and it's not, uh, in my view, the right way. So let's say you were starting today instead of 50 years ago, okay? How do you think, or or do you think, that the same doors would be open to you to get started today, given where culture has gone, as you have referred to in your previous response? Well, not certainly not in mainstream newspapers, which are declining, uh, not only in size, but in existence. Uh, At the height of my column, I was in over 500 newspapers, about one-fourth of the total newspapers in the country. But so many have closed. So many now have uh, uh, canceled opinion columns. Gannett, uh, one of the biggest change in the country, which Mm -hmm. owns USA Today and others, did away with all of its opinion columnists. All at once cost me about 100 papers that I was in. Uh, Their excuse was, uh, well, we don't need to tell people what to think. They can think for themselves. Oh, really? (laughs) (laughs) Gee, who knew? Uh, I mean, the greatest power the media have is the power to ignore. And there are a lot of stories that get ignored. I think if I were starting today, I'd probably have to you know, have a podcast or a blog or something like that, because the day of the syndicated columnist is over. I I think I'm probably a dinosaur, well, along with George Will and a few others. Uh, There just aren't many out there, and and newspapers uh, don't want to take on any new ones, uh, mostly for the cost. You know, it's interesting what you said about USA Today saying that, uh, well, we're not here to tell people what to think. Yeah, well, they don't need the op-ed sections anymore because they just do it through their reporting sections. All the opinions and everything come through there in addition to what they ignore. Well, USA Today used to be a really good newspaper, and they had opinions and uh, stories from all perspectives. But now the paper has become so thin, you can see the weather page from the front page. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, USA Today is only one of many Gannett newspapers. Gannett is a great uh, company, uh, has a great history. But uh, when you cut content and go up on the price, uh, I mean, that's just a recipe for suicide. What other business does that? And what other business doesn't pay attention to what the massive number of consumers or potential consumers care? If you had a burger franchise, for example, and you introduced a new burger and people didn't like it and stopped coming to your burger establishment, would you uh, continue to offer that burger? Uh, say it's good for you. I like it. You ought to like it too. Not if you want to stay in business. But uh, the the media are the only profession of which I am aware that doesn't care what a large swath of its consumers or former consumers thinks. It's the most amazing thing. They write for each other. They read each other. One of my favorite stories, a friend of mine who's a columnist for the New York Times, called me about something last year. And at the end of the conversation, he said, oh, by the way, are you still writing your column? I felt like saying, yeah, are you? I mean, <laughs> I read his, but he doesn't read mine. See? <laughs> so basically, it's reinforcement. Sure. Echo chamber. Yeah. It becomes a total echo chamber. Uh, I remember back in, I think it was 1991. So I, I was living in D.C. area at the time, and I, I went to the, the this big it was the March for Riot Life rally that you know about happens every year. And it was huge. There were hundreds and it was gathered around the Washington Monument. I was estimating 500,000 people. And I'm driving home and, and uh, WTOP radio, which I know you're familiar with, does a story and says thousands showed up for the rally. And I thought, what a perfect example of how you can change perception. So I called into WTOP and I said, listen, I was there. <laughs> I'm telling you. It wasn't thousands, and they actually did change it to hundreds of thousands. And then the Washington Post ran a story about it buried on the local page. And when the ombudsman was challenged about this, he said, well, when things were discussed on the weekend, nobody knew anybody who knew anybody who was going there. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) Well, this goes back to another story. Uh, A number of years ago in the Post, a reporter uh, wrote about evangelical Christians that they were poor, uneducated, and easy to command. 
And when they got a torrent of mail protesting that description, that stereotype, including people who included their uh, educational bona fides, master's degrees, PhDs, scientific backgrounds, uh, they wrote a sort of another story that said, well, we, what we really meant to say was that most of them are poor, uneducated, and easy to command. Well, they got another torrent of e email. And then the ombudsman at the time, this is really amazing. Her name was Joanne Bird. I'll never forget it. In her explanation of this, or her attempted explanation, she said, what you have to understand is we don't know many of these people. And I wrote a column and I said, what? You know, some may be living in your neighborhood, running down your property values. But this is an example <laughs> yes. of the bias and uh, and closed mindedness of so many in the media. There are more people in church on Sunday morning than watch NFL football games. And yet uh, they they know none of these people. It, it truly is that echo chamber and that constant reinforcing of our world is the only world that exists. And the reality is what you said earlier is that not only newspapers declining in circulation, and a lot of that has to do with the challenge of online, digital, and so on, but it's just people, and polling shows this, there's a large swath, and I would say it's probably now 50 to 60%, who just don't want to read this stuff anymore. They just go, you know what? Don't need it. Don't want it. I know the line. I know the narrative. So it's it's to your point. What business does that? I'm I'm reminded as we're doing this. You know, look at the whole Bud Light controversy right now. <laughs> Talk about ignoring your consumers, and they have struggled with trying to new ads, new whatever, and, and it, it just isn't working. Well, it's all wokeism, of course. Target, uh, you mentioned Budweiser. All these major corporations now feel they have to buy in to the LGBTQAI plus. Uh, political and uh, and social position. I remember something that uh, the late Roman Catholic Bishop Fulton J. Sheen, one of the early great communicators, uh, said, America is not so much overrun by the bigoted as we are overrun by the broad-minded. We now are told we have to accept everything because there is no absolute or objective truth. We all have our own truth. You have your truth, I have my truth. And even if they contradict, it's okay as long as we feel good about each other or ourselves. And this is just crazy. And, and you know, C.S. Lewis deals with this in Mere Christianity. He says, if you say there is no God, and then you say to someone, you know, you ought to share that piece of orange with that other person, you have just appealed to a standard you denied. And <laughs> So you can't really live as if there are no absolutes. Uh, try that with speed limits. You get pulled over for speeding the officer and say, well, sorry, officer, my truth is I ought to be going 75 miles in a 25 mile an hour zone. After he finished laughing at you, he'd probably double the fine. And that truly does speak to where we have come to, even to the point of our genders are totally subjective. Yeah. It's a matter of choice, not a matter of biology. And yeah. so here we are. So well, you had the you had the uh, the newest member of the uh, United States Supreme Court at her hearing. She was asked, uh, "What is a woman?" And her response was, "Well, I'm not a biologist. Excuse me. Well, I can define what a woman is, and most people can, and you can define what a man is. If you got the parts, that's who you are. Period." <laughs> well, such common sense is becoming increasingly lacking, but. I, I have hoped that there has been an overplay of the hand to some degree, uh, yeah. that this is maybe pushing a bridge too far. So, yeah. Well, you're reading stories now in the Wall Street Journal and other places that corporations are realizing that they made a mistake in going too far. Corporations are about selling products and services to as many people who will buy them. They're not about promoting various political and social agendas. I think uh, that was a big mistake that Disney made. I mean, Walt Disney would never have done this. Walt Disney was the most apolitical person of his age. He only spoke at one fundraiser in California for a Republican candidate for something or other uh, because uh, he was a longtime personal friend. But Disney's view was that we want to appeal to everybody. We don't want to single one group out over another or or make one uh, group of people feel hostile toward another. He wouldn't recognize the company that bears his name today. And so I think a lot of corporations, uh, Disney isn't because of their battle with Ron DeSantis, the governor in Florida, but a lot of others are realizing that they've gone too far and, uh, and their products aren't selling well. I, I forget how much 
uh, Budweiser has lost, but it's in the multi-millions because of people who are just not buying their product. 30% of sales as yeah. a latest report, 30%. That's pretty extreme. That's yeah, pretty, pretty extreme. extreme. That's yep. and and that's a good message. That's that's consumers out there saying, you know what, we're going to vote with our pocketbook. You won't listen to us any other way. So we've got your other choices, and I think that's a very positive thing. So I, I do too. Yes. So I want to shift back to your book here. Your book, Watchmen of the Night, a fascinating chronicling of significant events. You mentioned beginning in 1984 with the landslide uh, re-election of of Reagan. You have chapter titles like the year of 9/11, the year of the pandemic. As you look back, and this may be a little bit of a challenge, but I, I want to challenge you anyway on this. Would you say, what would you say were the top two or three key pivotal events that have influenced this secular leftward lurch that we're dealing with today? Top two or three significant events over the last 35 to 40 years that have really influenced why we have lurched so far to the left so quickly? Well, Guy, I think the events, as you uh, call them, are a reflection. They're not a determinant of what is happening in the country. We have Old and New Testament warnings about what happens to individuals and nations that forget God. Solzhenitsyn, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, warned what what happens to nations that forget God. And you have the so-called Generation Z, 20%, according to polls, are asked when asked their religious affiliation, say none. Mm. So... The events are reflected by that. You you don't get to a point of having over 65 million abortions in the United States, many more worldwide, uh, until you have a a secular progressive worldview take hold. But I think in in terms of actual events, I mean, 9-11 obviously was a major one, the collapse of the Berlin Wall. But I think the growing secularization of the country is what produces so many of these other things that we've been talking about. People ask me all the time, are we going to be able to turn it around? I say there's only one way absent a spiritual revival, which can only come from God himself. And that one way is to get our kids out of the indoctrination centers known as the government schools and stop sending them to these universities where leftover hippies from the 60s are teaching them that America is an evil country, critical race theory, and all of this other garbage that would have offended the founders. Uh, So that's the key, I think, to rescuing the nation. But I I just find it astounding. You know, we don't send our troops to Russia and China and Iran to be trained. We train them here. But we willingly send our children and grandchildren into these indoctrination centers to learn all this garbage, drag queen story time, and, and all of the rest, and expect them to come out still believing the values that their parents and grandparents believe in. It's the craziest thing that I've ever seen. I taught in the public schools 40 years ago. Yeah, different then. And they were different, but even then you could still see some of this coming. Yeah. And I would have disagreements with with other teachers, and, and that's a story for another time. But after I came out of that in the 80s, I worked with Christian homeschool groups in Iowa with respect to the laws that were putting people like Everett Sullivan in jail. I'm sure you remember that that experience back in Louisville, Nebraska. But my biggest frustration was in talking with Christian parents about exactly what you're talking about. And that is, is I I had a conversation with a pastor and I said, OK, so. Would you send your children to a denomination that disagrees with you fundamentally on some of your key points of doctrine in your church? Well, absolutely not. I mean, I wouldn't want them to go to Sunday school. And so I asked them, I said, but but why are you sending them 37 hours a week to a school that fundamentally, even if they're not saying explicitly, implicitly are promoting things? And this was 40 years ago. Yeah. One of the people I quote in the book is uh, the late First Lady Barbara Bush, who famously said that. Our success as a nation, your success as a family, uh, depends less on what happens in the White House and more on what happens in your house. Our children are on loan to us from God. There's no guarantee they're going to turn out the way we want them to. People say, well, if you do the following, your kids will turn out okay. I always respond, really? What do you think Adam and Eve's problem was? Bad father figure? Too much MTV? No, I don't think so. So uh, it's, it's one of those mysteries of life. But uh, but you're right, and I'm right. I mean, the excuse is given. You're, well, I want my child to be an ambassador for Christ. Well, I've met many ambassadors, but I've never met any that are seven or eight years old. 
you know, an ambassador has to be trained in the uh, in the beliefs of the country that he is representing or she is representing and the one that they're being sent to. You don't create an ambassador who's seven or eight or nine years old. Oh, I want my kid to play football. Well, I looked up in a concordance and I don't see the word football in there at all. <laughs> if you want them to at least have an opportunity to think biblically and to have a a, a complete worldview that's based on biblical principles, you can't send them into the government schools. And, and really, the, the the real excuse is people just don't want to spend the time or money. One of the few benefits, if you can call it that, from the pandemic is the realization of so many people of what is being taught in their schools. That whole Loudoun County, Virginia business, which yep. uh, Governor Glenn Youngkin rode to the governorship, is a perfect example of that. So homeschooling has increased markedly uh, during the pandemic, Christian schools and other private schools. You have uh, school choice programs of one kind or another in 37 states. It ought to be national. You know, the left is all for choice when it comes to abortion, but they're not for choice when it comes to education for those fortunate enough to have been born. That seems to me uh, wildly hypocritical. Yeah, this podcast is titled Flourishing Leadership. And it sounds to me like what you're doing is you're really issuing a challenge to listeners right now and say, if you're a parent, you need to exercise leadership in terms of what is going to give your children the best opportunity to grow up and think and look at the world through a biblical lens. That's what I'm hearing. You're issuing right. a real challenge to lead. You're, you're, hearing, you're hearing correctly. Uh, you know, we're, we're, too many parents think they want to be friends with their children. You know, you're not to be a friend with your child. You're to be a parent. You're to be a leader. You're to be an example. You're to be a disciplinarian. You're to be the, their first educator. All this stuff, well, I want my kids to like me. You listen to some of these talk shows, and people go, well, my, my daughter doesn't like me anymore, or my son is the I say, you're the parent. You know, take away their uh, iPhone. Take away their social media stuff if they're misbehaving or whatever. Respect will come, uh, ought to come first. Love will come later. <laughs> yeah, it's that, well, you know, it's good and strong words, definitely needed. Um, uh, so it leads me into my next question. When you look back on your life, what would you say are the most important lessons you have learned about what actually constitutes good servant leadership? Well, the first thing every human being needs to learn is that we are sinners. We're not uh, dysfunctional human beings who need to be uh, reformed. We need to be transformed. And that does not come through government. It doesn't come through politicians. One of my favorite verses on this is when King David was king over Israel. He said, do not put your trust in princes and kings or in mortal flesh that cannot save. That's good enough for me. Uh, so I think that's the beginning point. And people who don't understand that uh, don't understand why we have wars and rumors of wars, why we have envy of other people's uh, accomplishments. You know, in the last uh, open Medicare season, uh, I think it was last fall or winter, I live in Florida, so a lot of old people down here, and uh, I'm one of them now. And uh, the, there were four key words in every one of these Medicare supplement uh, ads, benefit, entitled, free and deserve. Yep. Nothing about personal responsibility, nothing about personal accountability. So we have moved from a time when I was growing up, when I was taught inspiration, followed by motivation, followed by perspiration, improves any life, to where we are today, the unholy trinity of the left, envy, greed, and entitlement. Mm. And they basically say, if you make $2 and I make $1, it's not fair. You owe me 50 cents. Well, that's socialism. I should be coming to you saying, how did you make the $2? Where did you go to school? What are your life principles? What's the philosophy you live by? What's your faith in? Because I want to be like you. But we don't do that anymore. And this is what you hear in the political dialogue. You know, everybody needs to pay their fair share in taxes. No, you need to be more responsible with what you're doing with the money that we're already sending you in Washington. The government gets more money than it's ever received in its entire existence. That's and yet, true. It yep. can't balance the budget because it can't control the spending. So the problem isn't revenue. The problem is self-control. But everybody believes they're entitled to other people's money, and, and the debt just grows and grows and grows, and no nation can ever sustain itself with that kind of debt. So the first thing you said is, is to recognize that we are sinners, 
And then you you segue to the whole notion of entitlement and so on, which of course reflects selfishness, self uh, the self-absorbed view of life. How do we, as ones who really want to follow Christ in the marketplace, and that's who most of my audience is. They're in business. They're in education. They're in a they're in a tough world. I mean, it's very hostile to Christianity these days. The animus is, as you know, is is palpable. How do we lead better in that world to help influence the direction of where our culture and our church is going? Well, a couple of things, uh, Guy. First of all, uh, we should not be surprised by any of this because Jesus told us it would come. And anything short of crucifixion uh, is is a blessing, right? So uh, I, I think that's the first thing we need to know. But I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I, I think we are too focused on a, um, well, how would I put it, a, a scenario for sharing the gospel. I think it was at St. Francis of Assisi who said, uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. Right. Uh, and, and so I'll tell you a quick story. When I was at a, went into a newspaper a number of years ago when I was trying to sell my column, uh, there was a man there who said, uh, hey, uh, can I see you in the hall a minute after you finish talking to the editor? I said, sure. He said, listen, I'm the only Christian on the staff. I never get my ideas in the paper. I'm thinking of leaving and going into full-time Christian service. I said, let me ask you a question. Your uh, colleague there uh, who sits next to you at the next desk, do you know uh, how she takes her coffee in the morning? Could you go get it for her? Uh, your boss, do you know his wife's name, how many kids he has? Could you go out to lunch with your colleagues and spend the entire time listening and finding out to them and not mentioning God once? Could you do that? Now, you know, God will move you out of here if you can't be a servant, but why don't you demonstrate uh, love and concern for other people? And then they'll ask you. Uh, I remember when I was working at CNN, there was a producer there. She said uh, one day, sensing something different about me, which usually doesn't take very long. She said, uh, what are you? I said, tall. She said, no, no, where do, you go? where do you go to church? I said, I am the church. She said, look, wise guy, what do you do on Sunday morning? I said, well, depending on how I feel, I get a cup of coffee, take a shower, read the newspaper. Look, when you leave the house, where do you go? I gave her an address. She said, is there a building there? I said, yeah. She said, what's the name of the building? I said, what are you getting at? She said, I want to know what you believe. Now, I said, we can have a conversation. Nah. Like the archaeologist who has to dig down through several layers of civilization to find out what he or she is looking for, we have built this structure around the person of Jesus of Nazareth that is offensive to many people. It's offensive to me. And sure. that people can't even get to him. Remember the crowds that surrounded him when he was here on earth with us? People couldn't get to him. We have built this structure around him that has nothing to do with him. It's pharisaical. It's judgmental. I want people to know who I'm for, not what I'm against. And uh, when you have that kind of attitude, I think that opens the doors of many hearts because everybody has the same questions. Who am I? Why am I here? Is there a God? Is there heaven and hell? How can I go to one and avoid the other? Those are basic questions that have been asked from the beginning. So we need to do it. You know, Jesus gave us the ultimate tools of evangelism. They had nothing to do with politics. because He said, my kingdom is not of this world, which ought to be sobering. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, care for widows and orphans, visit those in prison, clothe the naked, feed the hungry. That's it. Not as a social gospel, but as a means by demonstrating the love of God for the person so that they might be open to hearing about God's ultimate love, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for their sins and the atonement he took in our place. So we got it reversed. We want to do it the other way, and we wonder why more people aren't paying attention, because we're not being obedient to what Jesus commanded. That's why. Wow. Well, we'll not take up the offering. We'll not now. take up the offering. <laughs> yeah. Cal, I mean, it, it's so spot on, and it, it can be challenging. Well, of course it is, because the world that we are temporarily in is hostile to everything that Jesus commanded and taught. Oh, they they love him. Oh, how about turning the other cheek? I remember I was at Dartmouth College years ago doing a speech in the 80s, shortly after my, my column started. And uh, this was during a time when Reagan was putting Pershing missiles into Europe to counter what the Soviet Union was doing. I so, remember uh, that well. 
Right. So at the end of my talk, a questions, young man gets up, a student said, hey, uh, well, since you're a Christian, uh, what about uh, loving your enemy and turning the other cheek? I said, don't sit down, young man. I am absolutely overjoyed to see somebody here at Dartmouth College who believes in the scripture. I'll bet you also believe then what Jesus said, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to God but through him, right? He said, well, not exactly. I said, then sit down. <laughs> you know, Mary Poppins said it best, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And if, if we're known for being rigid and judgmental and hostile and angry and opposed to stuff, uh, that's going to send a message to people. But if we are self-deprecating, and boy, Reagan was great at this, uh, and if we are uh, humble, that's something that's not taught anymore, uh, then we're going to have the opportunity through demonstration first and then in word to share the ultimate message that God loves you and has a plan for your life that is energized when you come to him on his terms. So last question then to follow this maybe another side of this coin, what I see is a lot of fear. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of fear among people who profess Christ in the marketplace. I'm afraid of being doxxed. I'm afraid of being ostracized. I might even lose my job. Uh, you know, there's a lot of fear out there. What would you say to them in terms of, okay, servant leadership, how does that speak to fear? Well, I'd quote what Jesus said, don't be afraid. Fear not. Now, if you're a believer and have fear, then you're disobeying once again what he said. Don't worry about it. I got this. It's under my control. So if you lose your job, you know, I've lost jobs before. Uh, I was fired by NBC in 1973. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me because it forced me. It forced me. I was trying to live in two worlds at the same time. And it forced me to commit my life to Christ and to consider what really matters. Now, he put me on the dark side of the moon for 11 years to work me out of me. I'm a tall guy, so there's a lot of me to work out and to fill himself with me. And he put me in touch with people who taught me how to think, who taught me sound doctrine, uh, who taught me how to really witness to others. And that's what prepared me for this column. It's the most amazing thing. You know, we look at everything from our perspective. Uh, you know that verse in, uh, I think it's First Kings, where... E Elisha and the young man are, are surrounded by enemies yes. that want to kill them. And Elisha prays that God will open the young man's eyes. And he does, and he sees the armies of heaven on the mountain. And greater are they in number than these clowns down here. Now, we have to understand that there is a heaven. There is the Holy Spirit. There are angels who defend us. And stop looking at everything from the perspective of the world. This is the great lie that Satan tells. You know, he wants us to think like the world. He wants us to be like the world because he controls the world. And if we stop thinking that way and start thinking biblically and listen to what Jesus says, and, you know, look what Paul went through. I mean, he probably, yes. he probably had some fear, but he overcame it, you know? So uh, let's start thinking from God's perspective and focus on the armies of heaven who are greater than any armies on earth. And I would add to that as we bring this to a close, and let's seek out others who share that. Let's be in communities, whether it's three people or 30 people, so that we have that kind of mutually reinforcing encouragement that Paul talked about so oftentimes when he wrote to these churches that were under such great persecution, right. encourage one another, lift each other up, bear each other's burdens, because there are going to be these challenges. Well, this is what corporate worship is about. This is why we go to a building called church to be with other believers. This is why we have Bible studies. This is why we have fellowship groups uh, to push back against the world. You know, uh, uh, the, the whole thing about uh, going to the gym, you know, you don't get it. You don't get into shape by watching an exercise video. You got to go to the gym and use weights. And what do weight? What are weights? Weights are something that allow you to push against gravity, to push against the world in order to be in better shape. So if you want to push against the world and, and think more biblically, you go to corporate worship, 
You study the Bible. You surround yourself with friends who are believers, not exclusively, of course, because we've been put on the, in the world for two major reasons, to love God and honor and worship him, but also to be a servant to others, to share the gospel with them. So it's not complicated. It really isn't. The, the scriptures are a guidebook for this life and the next. We not only have to read them, we have to believe them, and we have to act upon them. And that is what results in putting on the whole armor of God to defend yourself against the ways of the world and to have the sword of truth in your hand to combat the evil one. And so, so needed today when we are in a world that is no longer a culturally accepting Christian world as it was, say, 60 years ago. It's well, a go different... look at Corinth, you know, go look, look at some of these other ancient cities and, you know, you read through the Old Testament, all these crazy false gods that the so many of the ancient Israelites worship. Crazy stuff. I mean, this was after uh, God parted the Red Sea. This is after God did all these incredible miracles that you read about, and the idiots still worship false gods and sacrifice their own children on altars. And you yeah. look at that, and you say, how dumb could they be? Well, you know, they're no different than you and me, because everybody has the capacity to do the same thing left unrestrained. And that's the yeah. heart of sin. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So every time you think that maybe you're better than the axe murderer or you're better than the fornicator or whatever, you just haven't had the right circumstances or opportunities. Well, Cal, thank you for joining the podcast today. Listeners, his memoir is A Watchman in the Night. It's a really good read, especially if you love history as much as I do. He, he not only recounts these great events that have occurred, but also gives his perspective on them. Uh, it's it's definitely worth worth the read. And I want to thank you, Cal, because yours is really an inspirational testimony. I mean, the, the how, how you have well, walked in the world of, of media, where so many Christians say, we need to stay away from those things and get out of those things. Well, you have been in there and you have been a light and you've been a, a you know, an agent of change. And just in building the relationships you have, to who knows what ripple effects those have had over the years. Well, I hope they have. But, you know, you mentioned about people getting out of it or not going into it. Well, that's the problem. The only thing I learned in physics before I flunked table of contents was the nature of abhors a vacuum. Now, you may be old enough to remember a, a coffee brand called Chase and Sanborn. Oh, yes. They had a vacuum packed coffee tin a little thing on the top that you'd push and it would click just to prove that it was a vacuum. But then you took the key and you twisted it around the side and you'd hear the air rush in. Right. Just like that. So that was proof. And that's how they sold Chase and Sanborn coffee on a vacuum pack. I don't know really what difference that made. But we pulled out of the arts. We pulled out of journalism. And what would you expect to occur if you create a vacuum? We need more young people going into these professions if we want to see them changed. Correct. Absolutely correct. Well, thank you, Cal, again for joining us. Uh, listeners, I'm a certified professional leadership coach. And as the, and in that role, I have the privilege of working with leaders of all ages and backgrounds, C-level executives, nonprofit leaders, small business owners, self-employed professionals. I am passionately driven to help each of these men and women be better servant leaders every day. And in this podcast, my goal is to help you do the same. That's my calling. That's my mission. And if this message today speaks to you, please subscribe to this podcast by searching Flourishing Leadership with Guy Rogers on your favorite podcast app, such as Apple or Spotify. You can find us on YouTube. YouTube channel is youtube.com slash the at symbol Flourishing Leadership, youtube.com slash at Flourishing Leadership. And please let your friends and colleagues know about it. Check us out at flourishing-leadership.com, where you can learn more about my leadership coaching approach and methodology, how it can help you, and where you can also find all of these podcast episodes housed. Because today, your leadership, flourishing leadership, has never been more needed. <laughs>